Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. It's Laurie Smith here, and it's One Child to Be Survivor to Another Restoration. 6.30 here in the morning, and it is September 1st. It's Thursday, the 1st of September. And uh, glad to be here, glad to do this show. I'm just waking up, having a coffee. Haven't been awake all that long, so <laughs> I'm trying to wake up here. And uh, just hope you, you hope your morning's going well. And thank you for joining me here. I appreciate it. I appreciate everybody who's tuning into my shows. And I hope you're getting something out of them. I know um, I'm finding the information helpful, so you know, hopefully it's helping you too. You know, it's just a little morning reflection, looking at you know my healing journey, and hopefully in that and doing that, you know, some of the information will be helpful for you too if you're a survivor of abuse. And so, you know, um, thanks very much for for. Uh, for joining me and we'll get right into this um if you're on a, a healing journey and you're not sure where you're at you want to do a safety first check just to make sure that you're safe enough to listen to this type of stuff or anything to do with with abuse because it could trigger your own abuse situation and if you're if you're not sure where you're at in your healing journey you know you might want to be careful because that can trigger you and then send you backward you know sort of and you might might you know don't want to be causing yourself any distress or or you know, kind of going backward in your journey. So, make sure you're safe enough to listen. And if you don't know how to how to sort of check that or gauge that, um, there's a Survivor to Thriver manual from from uh, ACS, a, a, the Adult Survivors of Child Abuse ASCS, a, ASCA. That's a Morris Center program, and they have this Survivor to Thriver workbook there um, that you can download for free. And the first 60 pages or so are devoted to a chapter called Safety First. And so you do want to get that information. Make sure you're safe enough to listen because, um, you know, nobody wants you to go backward in your healing journey. And so you want to make sure you're safe and then um, to know where you're at, right? So thanks, everybody. We'll get right into this. And um, we're just looking at Havoka's um, Victim to, to Survivor to Thriver. This is the last one here that they have on their website. It's Havoka, H-A-V-O-C-A dot org. Havoka, that's help for adult victims of child abuse. And um, they had this really cool victim to survivor to thriver thing to gauge where we're at sort of thing and we're on the last one this morning and this morning's is uh, the victim is uh, might be suffering from depression and uh, the survivor is it has a movement of feelings and the thriver is experiencing aliveness so <laughs> that's pretty cool um yeah this is uh i mean you know as far as depression goes i mean some of it's clinical and some of it's not and i mean you know if a person's suffering like from clinical depression, that's my parents. Well, my mom had uh, was bipolar, and they used to call it manic depression. And uh, my brother was also diagnosed with that as well. And so it runs in our family. Um, but you know that's a uh, that's a little bit different than somebody who's just depressed. You know, for and and just depressed for a period of time, and can actually pull themselves out of it. And so, you know, for somebody to be experiencing depression as a, as a victim of abuse, I mean, it's quite often, it's quite common for survivors of abuse to be experiencing some depression, even if it's not clinical. You know, so it's a yeah, it's a serious issue. Um, I know that's where I was so many years ago, and am I there now? No, I've definitely made huge progress in that. Um, survivor has movement of feelings, so I'm in between the. Survivor and probably more towards the thriver now because I don't suffer those periods of blue, like really super um, down, depressive type states where, you know, I mean, I was seriously considering ending my life. I had a suicidal ideation most of my life, and um, two of my brothers committed suicide. Suicide sort of ran in our family, unfortunately. My mother was had suicidal ideation, and um, she was always talking about killing herself all the way through when I was growing up, all the way through to into my adulthood. And my dad was always attempting suicide. So his deal was that he was actually attempting suicide. He was actually really trying to kill himself and sometimes doing suicide, uh, fam- familicide, where he would do one time he tried to drive me and my sister over a cliff with him in the car. And um, so this kind of stuff, you know, this is how I grew up. And so this was always in my mind. And so. This is how this was put there. This is like a child learning how to tie their shoelaces or learning how to brush their teeth or uh, comb their hair and stuff. I was learning how to kill myself, right? Because that's what my parents were showing me how to do. And I just modeled my parents and so did my siblings and two of my siblings killed themselves, right? It's very distressing. Um, I'm actually in so much a better place than I've ever been um, now. And so even there, there's struggles, there's trials, there's always going to be something in life that's going to come our way 
that's going to throw a, throw us for a loop. You can't escape that being on the planet. There's no perfect situation. I mean, even somebody, we could say, okay, well, if I just had so much money and I was just really, really wealthy and, you know, and I had like all this money, you know, millions of dollars in the bank and just totally set for life, there would still be something come up because generally then it would be a health issue or it would be a death in the family. It would be something that would be, that would send us for a loop, right? There's, this is life, right? There's no perfect situation. Um, so it's a matter of being able to handle and cope with what comes our way. I've been able to handle and cope with things so much better now that I'm on my healing journey than I ever have been able to do, you know. Um, so I'm definitely much more towards the thriver on this, you know. Um, and I just have periods, little odd periods of time where for just a, even maybe a couple of hours I might be feeling down about something. It just generally, generally doesn't last, you know, for three or four days where I'm just so, I can't even pull myself out of it. I used to get like that, and now I'm, you know, that doesn't happen to me at all because I've moved through a lot of the feelings. I've worked through a lot of the feelings, the anger, the rage, the the sheer sort of, uh, oh, just the, the whole entire trauma of being abused as a child. I've worked through most of it, and, and it's, you know, I'm still working on some of it, but I still, most of it I have worked through. And so I feel a lot better than I've ever felt before in my lifetime. And so um, I'm definitely more towards the thriver on that. But, like, if you're suffering from depression and, you know, you can't pull yourself out, you know, it's a good idea to get help. I really wish that I would have got help a long time ago because I, I allowed myself to suffer in this by myself. Nobody knew I was having these difficulties. You know, I, I wouldn't run around telling people, I'm an abuse survivor and I'm thinking about killing myself. <laughs> I mean, I'd go to work and laugh. People thought I was great to have around. You know, I love to have a good time. So I'd... People would invite me to their parties, and I'd go do things with them, go out with people, have a good time. I have a husband, you know, and nobody knew that I was good, that I was I was sitting around, you know, for periods of time in my lifetime, wanting to self-injure or, or wanting to end my life. So this is the thing. I just suffered in this alone, you know, and I really wish I would have got help a long time ago because I wasted a lot of time in a circular pity party, right? And people, I mean, people say, well, you know. Some people are really harsh about that, and they say, "Yeah, you're just having a pity party." But actually, it was just a cycle that had been shown how to, been shown how to live a certain way, and I didn't know how to break that cycle. And so, you know, I'm glad that I finally figured, you know, got enough sense to get some help, right? But it took me to the age of 42 to do it, and I wish that I would have done it a lot, lot sooner than, you know, in my 20s, <laughs> when I really figured out that I needed serious help. So, you get help, you know. Don't suffer with this stuff alone, you know. Don't, I mean, I wish my mother would have got help. I wish my dad would have got help. I wish my two brothers would have got help, you know, the ones that killed themselves. Um, I wish the remaining family members that I have on the planet, which is very few, would get help. Um, they're still suffering, but they suffer in silence because they don't want anybody to know where they're at. You know, they don't want anybody to know the secrets of the trauma of their of their horrific life, you know, but I've spelled it out for the world, but but they can still remain hidden away because nobody knows who they are, my my siblings. But the thing is, is, you know, it's really horrific and uh, for to suffer on your own like that. So I would say make sure you get some help, you know, it's very, very important. We're going to look at this uh, inner child info from Havoka this morning. And this is um, Why Heal Your Inner Child. We started just looking at this yesterday. It's kind of an interesting article. They're just talking about the fact that it's only been a few generations in recent history, really, that society is quote unquote here they've got has even recognized child abuse as a crime instead of an inherent right of a parent, right? Or of the parent. The concept of healthy parenting as a skill to be learned is very new in society. So I think this article is really important because a lot of people don't realize that um it's only been recently that people have been talking about the fact that it's it's a crime. Child abuse is a crime and and that children have <coughs> excuse me, children have rights, you know? And that they have the right to life, right? They have the right to they have so many rights. Actually, children have mo have a few more rights than actually adults do, um, and you know that's because they have the right to be looked after and cared after in a loving home, and um, in a caring home, right? In nurturing home, that's actually one of the rights in child rights. I mean, I studied child rights, and it's like you know, it's just a few generations, really. A few. It's recent history. And I was talking yesterday about the fact that, you know, even in the 60s, you know, they still didn't take child abuse very seriously. And you could kill your children. I mean, you could just do whatever you want. They didn't remove us out of the home. There was, CPS was involved, you know. And my parents were busted on child abuse charges. But nothing was done, and they didn't remove us from the home. They did come and check on us for a little while. 
and then that was it. But there's that's why children are dying today because they don't remove them from the home. And then even if they do and they put them in a foster care situation, I know foster care children who have been uh, abused in foster care, see? So they were abused at home, then they were abused in the foster care system, and then they were... And then, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, this is a really horrific situation. It's still going on, and we know this, right? So obviously if we're survivors of abuse, we know this. But this is why I really speak out against child abuse, because it's... I have a voice, and I can use it. It makes me really mad that so many people just don't care. They just don't think it's all that important, but I do. And, you know, it's really horrific what's going on out here. So they go on to talk about that a little bit more, and then they say, as adults, we react to the programming of our childhood. So to contend that our childhood emotional wounds have not affected our adult lives is ridiculous. I like what they have to say here. They said, to think that our early programming has not influenced the way we have lived is to be in denial to an extreme. And that's what the world, this is me talking, <clears throat> that's what the world wants um wants to believe, you know, they just think like, oh, can't you just get over it, you know? Is it, you know, could could your reactions into your adult life and how you've lived your your adult life to the point where you're at right now doesn't have anything to do with your childhood? A lot of people say that, and, you know, they're so wrong, and they are so extremely wrong, and they need to give their heads a shake and do some study, right? Because <laughs> there's huge studies out there now. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just woke up, and my voice is not there yet. So the issue is, is that everything we experience as a child is affects how we how we how we navigate as an adult, <laughs> and you know if we don't get help with certain things, we're just going to continue on in those old cycles of programming. And I mean, this is so true, right? It says here um, because society standards for what constitutes success are dysfunctional. Many people can be pointed out who have quote unquote risen above their path to be a success. It is those people who are supposedly successful that are running the world. So how good a job do you think they're doing? Right? It's our world leaders reacting out of the fear and insecurity of their inner children and the dysfunctional belief systems underlying civilization who give us war, poverty, billionaires, and homelessness. Well, it's true because people are, you know, these adults out here who are running the world right now and who will be until they pass on and the next generation picks it up um, are not uh, making uh, good decisions <laughs> it's pretty obvious and many of them are acting like they're saying many of them are acting and reacting really out of their own insecurities of their inner children right because it's just a it's a horrific mess I, I i agree with what they're saying there they said we cannot love our neighbors ourselves as long as we are judging and comparing ourselves to to them in order to feel good about ourselves so it says we cannot have a society that meets the essential emotional and spiritual needs of its members as long as we're reacting to life in alignment with rules of interaction that we learned in junior high school. So it says we're all connected, not separate. We all have worth and deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Instead of earning society's version of worth by stepping on and over our fellow humans to say nothing of destroying the planet we live on. Isn't that the truth? I speak a lot about this stuff because it's so true, right? It's like uh, people's big thing is i got to get ahead, so i got to step on whoever i got to step on. Well, I mean, it kind of goes down basically that's what was going on in my family. My, you know, my abuser parent, my parents were abused, and I call them my abuser parents. They were abused, and they just figured, I got stepped on, so I'm stepping on you. <laughs> and that's what they did. And so the abuse just continued on. They didn't care about their children, and they were hurt and wounded, so they hurt us. And that's all. They want misery loves company. And they were not willing to get help. They could have got help, but CPS got involved. Uh, they were actually they were actually court ordered to get help, uh, mental help. Uh, they were ordered to have counseling, all kinds of counseling. <laughs> None, they didn't want help. They they didn't want to change their really toxic, dysfunctional ways of living. They they did want to sit around and cry about the fact that their life was so horrible. Their children were rotten, and they should have killed them at birth. But you know, it's a uh, you know they wanted to just blame everybody. They didn't want to change. See, and that's the world. The world doesn't want to change. The world wants to continue on in its sickness, and that's why we see what's going on out here. This is a really horrific situation, but they're talking about it on a global level, but when you think about it, it is all st it's all very much the same in, a, in an abusive home, right? There was no help. There was no change, you know, and my mom would say stuff like, this is the way it is. You don't like it, you know? She'd be threatening a beating. She'd be like, oh, you know, if you, 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 you're going to just deal with this, and you're not going to let anybody with any Anyone, what's going on in this home? You're not getting help, and you're just going to sit here and take what I'm dishing out, you know? And it's uh, horrific, right? It's really horrific. That's what the world says. We all just have to take this toxic, dysfunctional garbage, you know? It's really, uh, it's not cool. And uh, I like what they have to say there. 
So they said, uh, it is through he- healing our inner child wounds that we can learn to respect and love ourselves. And so that we can know how to treat others with respect <clears throat> and love. Right? It's through healing our inner child that we can save our planet and evolve into a society that does meet the essential needs of its members. And so we'll pick up the rest of that, um, looking at that tomorrow. It's kind of interesting, I think. You can find that at Havoka.org, H-A-V-O-C-A.org. This is just the kind of the beginning part of the inner child healing work, and this is why why heal your inner child. And so this is why I wanted to look at that. It's quite interesting. Positive reinforcement. What am I doing right in my daily walk here, looking at positives and progress instead of negative thoughts and stuff? Um yeah, I can't be too hard on myself. I just got over a cold. <laughs> it's like my husband fell last week and hurt himself, and I was really, really stressed out. And there's just kind of a little bit too much going on. And I just found out that we have to move, and uh, my husband and I have to move. We have to, we just renting, and we have to vacate um, the, the place we're living. I've been here nine years, and I have a lot of stuff. And <laughs> it's like I got to start packing and cleaning. And I'm like, okay, am I prepared? And we're never prepared for stuff like that. So I'm just decided to take it easy, and um, I got a long weekend coming up, and I got off. I'm off until Tuesday, starting uh, Friday afternoon. So I got Friday afternoon, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, until Tuesday morning to relax. And I thought I'm not packing and cleaning. No, I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to take a break for a, a me break for my and my for my husband as well because I don't get to see him much, even though we live and we're together. But he's busy. I'm busy and he's sick. So he's busy sleeping. He sleeps a lot, and I work a lot. So we don't get to spend much time together. And I thought, no, I'm going to take the weekend and spend the weekend with my husband. It's his birthday this weekend, and um, we're just going to enjoy ourselves. And we're just going to take it easy and watch movies and be good to ourselves. And, you know, and then we can get busy and start packing and all that. We have months before we have to move, actually, so I'm not going to panic over it. And um, I, I need to get better. I need to get over this cold, right? So which that's what I plan on doing this weekend instead of running around. I'm just going to take it easy and have a me weekend and read a book and put my feet up. And So I think that's a smart, wise decision. I'm finally getting a little smarter in my older age. And so I think that's what I'm doing, right, is I'm sort of working on things and, and, and weighing what's weighing out what is um, – What's necessary, what's not, you know, um, what's priority, what's not. So I think that's positive. Um, here's a positive affirmation we could say. Yesterday's was I make co- decisions confidently. Today's is today I am a new person. I could say that. I could walk around saying today I am a new a new person. Actually, I mean, every, every day I wake up, I could say that. Um, that's a nice thing to think, you know. Today I'm a new person, right? Um, I don't know. I don't, uh, pers- I don't personally like that one, but a person could do that, I suppose. Um you know, I'm a new person kind of means, I guess, today's a new day and I can, and I can make things happen today that, that don't have to be, that, that are different, that are positive. That's something that I would, I would probably rather think, um, is that today's a new day, you know, it's a new challenge and I can, I can definitely affect and influence the way that it goes. It depends on me because it's my day. <laughs> so I can either have a really good day or I can have a bad day and, and there could be some bad stuff coming my way today but it depends on how I deal with it to what kind of day I'm going to have. So that's kind of how I live my life now, right? Every day is kind of like that for me anyway because I've decided that I don't want to spend the rest of my life in misery. I already spent my my whole entire life until 42 years old sort of in semi-misery. As a child, I was definitely in misery. And, I mean, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to, I want to have a good life, you know, and I want to... I want to heal and move forward and treat people right, treat myself right, and do the right thing, you know, and enjoy some of this time here, right? So it's how we choose to live, really. We make that choice every day when we wake up, right? When I wake up, if I want to wake up and just be miserable and be mean to people and be, not be good to myself, well, that's my choice, right? That's how my parents were. That's why we were abused, right? <laughs> they woke up in the morning and they decided that they were going to treat us really horrifically. And, I mean, that could include physical abuse, uh, you know, verbal insults all day, you know, emotional, psychological abuse, and that's how they lived their lives and that's how they treated us. You know, and, and you know, my brother decided that he was going to sexually abuse me, you know what I mean? And he just woke up one day and he figured, hey, I'll just use her for a sex toy. And that's what he did for a year. And these are decisions that we make. We can make these decisions, right? I mean, I can get up every morning and I can say, I can choose to be hateful and hateful to people and hate what, and, and be so much in hatred about what happened to me and my body. <laughs> you know, or I could wake up in the morning and I can say, you know what? No, it's a new challenge. It's a new day. 
and I've kind of always been doing that just to because I realized otherwise it was going to be a real waste of a life, you know. And um, something inside me has always been telling me to to not allow my abusers to win this fight, you know, that I need to win this fight by having a good life, right, a, a, a healthy life, you know, being good to myself and enjoying people, enjoying myself and living, finding some enjoyment out of life and some, some goodness, right? And so that's where I'm at. But um, I could say today I'm a new person. Today I'm a new person with, and I can make my life today you know, the best that it can be just by, just by allowing myself to do that, right? Instead of carrying hatred and, and, uh, despair into every single moment that I breathe, you know, I mean, that's what I was doing, right? Um, and that wasn't getting me anywhere. And so I thought, you know, no, I need to change this, right? So today's a new day. I can, I can accept the challenges that come my way and it doesn't mean I have a good day every day. Actually, I don't, you know, nobody does, right? But at the end of the day, I can say, well, I did my best. <clears throat> you know, I did the best job that I could with the time that I had today to be good to myself, to be good to others, and to handle things properly. And, you know, it's 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 tough. It really is, you know, especially when we don't have the information. And my husband is so sick and he's so he's really so ill that he can't deal with things, you know. He can't hardly look after himself. He can't cook for himself. He can't hardly do – he can't carry things for himself. He can't really do anything for himself. He does – he can get to the bathroom and stuff like that. He can shave. He can – he does that kind of stuff. But he can't cook and he can't really do much anymore. So it's like, you know, I can't really – I don't want to stress him out with things, so I do take I take the load on, you know, and it's like that's fine, you know, because that's that's what I I already know, and we've discussed it many times with my husband and myself. If it was me in the same situation, and it was me who was sick and he was well, he would do that for me. He wouldn't have just left me and dumped me off the side of the road and said, "Oh, you're sick, you're terminally ill. I'm just going to leave you. <laughs> bye bye. I'm going to go find another woman who's who's not sick and terminally ill." Um, that's wrong, you know. I mean, we're 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 in this through the thick and the thin. I'm glad to be able to help him out. And, uh, you know, it makes me happy to be able to do that for him. He helped me out when we first got together, when he, he was helping me out to get through through my abuse, a lot of my abuse. So he's he's been a very helpful, supportive person to me. And I want to be that for him, right? And so, you know, it's all a challenge. It depends on how we want to face it, how, how we want to handle it, right? And so it's very important to make sure we take a look at those things. Self-care, what am I doing uh, physically, spiritually, emotionally to care for myself um, and to care for ourselves? Well, physically, I'm still working on doing all that stuff, but I have had no time. Um, I haven't even had time to, to do anything, really. Um, it's been an incredibly busy couple of weeks, and I can't, uh, because I had caught that cold, I decided I didn't want to start working out and all that with the cold, right? And which I think was smart. <laughs> so I'm just trying to rest, really, is what I'm trying to do. So I guess that's my thing. That's what I'm doing right this week is just resting, um, trying to make sure that I'm, you know, spiritually sort of um, emboldened, you know, to, to keep going and to do it as, you know, to handle this stuff with, you know, properly, you know, not let it get me down. Emotionally, same thing, you know, just continue on um, and keep going day to day, keep looking for looking for that hope, you know. I do have a lot of hope. I do have hope. I do have faith, actually. And um, that helps me out, helps me get through the day. And Havoka has this really cool Survivor's Bill of Rights thing, and we're looking at the personal communication part. It says, in the sphere of personal communication, they said, you have the right to, and then today's is to resolve doubt without deferring to the views or wishes of anyone. So to resolve doubt without deferring to the views or wishes of anyone. Yeah, that's true. We can. We don't have to, you know, we can resolve doubts that we might have um, without having to to just go by what somebody else has said or somebody else's view, right? We all have our own views and wishes and, and you know, our own ideas on things. So we can resolve our doubts uh, with that. We don't have to defer to other people's views or wishes of anyone. Because a lot of times people will try to they're trying to be helpful, right? We might be saying, oh, well, I I don't think I'm ever going to heal or I don't think this is ever going to happen, you know, because we're talking out loud, right? And then somebody next to us who maybe might be a really caring individual and actually probably is is for the most part is trying to be helpful and they'll, they'll say something like, well, if you would just get over it, you know, if you would just forgive and forget. I've had so many people do this to me, including my abusers. You know, well, not, my, not all of my abusers. My mother never asked me to forget. And my mother never, never said that. And my, my brother didn't either. But my dad, he, one time he actually said to me, actually more than once, he said, you just need to forgive and, and forget and move on. You know, my abuser dad, who just abused the whole entire family and me, you know, the whole time I was growing up, 
and he was abusing them 20 years before I even arrived on the planet. Um, you know, it's kind of ridiculous that this man would sit there and tell me that I just need to forgive and forget and move on. <laughs> He's one of, one of my abusers. He's never asked me for forgiveness in his lifetime. So why would I want to forgive him? You know, the thing is, is like, I don't have to listen to that stuff, but that's just the case. I mean, some of these people, it wouldn't necessarily be the abuser saying that. But I mean, I've had other people tell me that too friends and stuff be like you really need to forgive your abusers and you just need to just move on and you know i don't see why this would be affecting you so badly it's like i don't know have you been through what i've been through can you honestly tell me that you've been through what i've been through no none of us has been none of us have been where somebody else has been this is all horrific and the thing is is it's you know we've all experienced it, even though like i said before is like we do have a common bond because we're survivors of abuse that's as far as it goes everybody's abuse is their own nobody's experienced the exact same thing i mean i've experienced child rape but that doesn't mean it's the same as somebody else who's experienced child rape you know and this is the thing it's just so we kind of have this common bond in that we're survivors of of abuse and different types of abuse but that's as far as it goes because the situations are all different Right, And we're different. People are different. So we're all going to handle things differently. I've had many times people try to project their ideas and thoughts on me. And um, I don't have to listen to that. And, you know, I don't have to try to resolve my issues by what somebody else, is their advice that somebody's giving me. But it's nice that sometimes people are trying to be helpful. And that's fine. You know what I mean? Um, but I don't have to sit there and just do and follow everything that they say. I can make my own decisions on what I need to do. I think it's very important to take control of your healing journey, and that's what I did, and take control of your life. <laughs> we are the only ones that can really do that. And I, I decided I wanted to be the adult, and I wanted to um, do the right things because I've never been shown how to do anything right to live as an adult properly. So I had to figure all this stuff out myself or try to look for help elsewhere because I wasn't shown how to do this. I don't know how to do adult life, right? I don't know how to do relationships and I don't know how to live as an adult, right? So it's really difficult for me and I find I have to reach out all the time because um, I can't figure this stuff out on my own. You know what I mean? A lot of it. I need to help. So I look around. I, I look for information. So I do, you know, defer a lot of times to what's going, what other people's views and whatnot on stuff, but not always. I've you know, I want to be the adult in the situation, and I want to, and I want to be in charge of my life. You know what I mean? And so, you know, if it's something I can't figure out, I'll have to look around for info. But otherwise, I try to resolve this stuff myself. You know, because that's important. We need to be in charge of our life, right? Personal Bill of Rights. Uh, this is really cool. This is Charles H. Whitfield, M.D. Heal healing the Child Within. You can find this just anywhere. I found it on Pinterest, but you can find it elsewhere too. It's everywhere. There's 38 of them, and he's got here. And we are on. Which one are we on? We're on number 23. These are really cool. I like looking at these. Um, 23 says, I have a right to stability. Uh, for instance, like roots, I have the right to stability and stable, healthy relationships of my choice. Isn't that right? Stable, healthy relationships. I have the right to stability and stable, healthy relationships of my choice. That's cool. That's what I'm working on. I'm actually quite stable now, really, um, as far as that goes, as far as me goes, except for my, I'm not all that, I'm not 100% stable, I don't know if anybody ever is, really, we're all he working on a healing journey here, even the people that think that they're not are, because nobody's really, nobody, nobody's there yet, you know what I mean, but um, I'm working on trying to be more stable in relationships, you know, because I'm trying to find my, pinpoint my uh, actions and reactions to things, and make sure that I'm not I'm not moving from a wounded inner child position, doing things, making decisions based on my woundedness from my childhood. So, um, you know, these things are really important to take a look at. So I think that's pretty good. And, um, yeah, just, you know, we have about a minute left here. I think we'll finish up here. Um, take care of yourself. Make sure, you know, if you're suffering and you're having a hard time and you don't know how you're going to cope, you don't, you don't know what you're going to do. I've been there. Uh, so many of us have been there, you know, so many millions. Um you know, you reach out to somebody. Make sure you get some help. Be very careful who you who you reach out to. Make sure they're trustworthy. And if you you know if you can't find somebody around that's trustworthy, which you know I mean half the time, more than three three quarters of the time, probably can't find somebody that's trustworthy, then call a crisis line. You know, call somebody, but make sure that you get help. Don't suffer on your own, and and you know don't allow yourself to go down. You know this is not this is not fair. It, we did not deserve to be abused. I'm sorry. I keep saying it. I don't mind saying that. See, a lot of people don't want to hear that, and a lot of people don't like to say it. We did not deserve to be abused. I can walk around saying that all day. I did not deserve that. You didn't. Nobody does. 
And so we don't deserve to have a horrible life because of the abuse. It wasn't our fault. And we shouldn't have to pay the price as adults for something that happened to us, you know, throughout our life in our childhood or whatever, um, because somebody did something to us that was incredibly wrong. You know what I mean? And why should we have to suffer and then go down and, and be miserable and have this miserable adult life because of that? That's not fair. That's not right. And we deserve to get help. So you make sure, like I'm saying, if you can't cope and you're listening to this, you make sure you get some help. And everybody, I hope you have a wonderful day. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. And we'll just be back on tomorrow morning. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. <laughs>